Uh, it, it is a pleasure to uh, be speaking with uh, folks in Pakistan again. Um, I have done a lot of work uh, around the uh, biology curriculum in Pakistan, uh, but it has actually been uh, some time uh, since I've really engaged uh, with uh, Pakistani uh, curricula or teachers, uh, and, and I'm, I'm really glad to revisit this. Um, so um, I, I have the, the poster here uh, that uh, Rashid sent along uh, advertising, so I, I think I should probably stick to what is here. Uh, and I want to kind of give you a little bit of information about where I'm coming from, my, my background, and how I got into this kind of uh, topic. But I, I realized that um, the abstract here makes a claim that I need to address at some point as well, that evolution is the central principle that underlies and unifies the modern biological sciences, and that it is not a controversial scientific topic uh, for the scientific community. Um, so we're gonna address that, and we'll definitely talk about uh, the differences between uh, Pakistani and United States um, educational context. Um, and I think I need to uh, talk a little bit about uh, the way that um, the, the uh, separation of church and state plays out in both countries and how this has been contentious in the United States and how Pakistan is actually quite a bit more comfortable a place to teach evolution with respect to um, students' religious uh, identities and understandings. Uh, so let's go ahead and get into this a little bit. Um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about myself. Uh, I am a biology professor at Syracuse University in the state of New York. If you're familiar with United States geography, we have the state of New York right here. New York City is way down here, what we call downstate. The rest of it is called upstate, and I'm in central New York, right here where this orange star is. And you get a little bit of an idea of what our campus looks like. But I haven't always been a professor at uh, Syracuse. I haven't always lived in New York. Uh, United States is a fairly large country, and uh, it is very diverse in its geography and uh, the uh, kind of culture that you find in different states and regions. So I was actually uh, born, you can uh, see where the stork delivered me. I don't know if that is a, a common um, uh, kind of mythological euphem euphemism for delivering of babies, uh, but I was brought to uh, Jonesboro, Arkansas. So this is my home state where I was born and you can see it in relation to the other states of the United States and here's New York. Um, now that's actually kind of significant to the topic today because Arkansas has been at the center of a lot of the um, disagreements and arguments in court cases uh, around the teaching of evolution in the United States. Um, so I uh, was, was born here in Arkansas, that's where I was raised. I attended my undergraduate uh, university at a um, conser uh, conservative, um, Christian uh, religious uh, university. Uh, it's called Harding University. Uh, and then I uh, moved on to other things. I earned the, a, a degree in biology here at Harding uh, with a minor in Bible, uh, and then uh, decided that um, I really needed to be somewhere else because I was very interested in the foraging ecology of sea otters. Uh, so I went out to Portland State University in Oregon, pretty far away from uh, Arkansas and far away from where I am now in New York, uh, out on the uh, Western coast of the Pacific Ocean here. Uh, and I earned a graduate degree in biology there. I'm also very interested in uh, geology uh, and I earned a second um, graduate degree at uh, Mississippi State University. So back down here in the South, closer to where I was uh, uh, born and raised um, and earned a graduate degree in um, geology or, or really rather uh, geosciences uh, at Mississippi State. Um, I was teaching biology and uh, sciences in community colleges and universities for a while. 
and started to see that um, students had some real cognitive difficulty understanding biology as a unified discipline uh, if they didn't understand key uh, concepts like um, you know the central dogma, uh, transcription, translation, DNA, those kinds of things, but also ecological concepts like um, the flow of energy through ecosystems, the recycling of, uh, uh, of nutrients, those kinds of things. But also evolution was a key thing that uh, kept students from understanding biology as unified. So I uh, went to a place called McGill University in uh, Montreal, uh, Canada, uh, to get a PhD working in the Evolution Education Research Center, which was at the time a partnership between uh, McGill and Harvard University. And it's from there that I went on to uh, Syracuse. Now, I know I have a statement uh, in, the, um, in the abstract that uh, places evolution as central and unifying and non-controversial in science. So I feel like I need to back that up a little bit. Now I'm going to do a thing that's not necessarily all that scientific. I'm going to appeal to authority a little bit. Um, but um, when I'm looking at something so broad as evolution that deals with evidence from so many different scientific fields, uh, it's important to understand what uh, the experts who have examined the evidence from those fields have come down to agree upon. Uh, so I'm going to show you uh, a statement from 67 National Academies of Science representing countries from around the world. Now, academies of Science are generally the top scientists in their field uh, who advise the governments of various uh, countries on matters of science and technology. Uh, so uh, there's a, a really great statement that has come from uh, an inter-academy panel uh, that sums up what the uh, national academies uh, from these different countries can agree upon. So I'm going to give you a bunch of words here uh, are known as evidence-based facts. All right, so this is directly from this statement. It says, we agree that the following evidence-based facts about the origins and evolution of the earth and life on this planet have been established by numerous observations and independently derived experimental results from a multitude of scientific disciplines. Scientific evidence has never contradicted these results. Now, here we go. They're gonna list some things that are evidence-based facts that they agree upon that scientific evidence has never contradicted. And this is what they agree upon that in a universe that has evolved toward its present configuration for some 11 to 15 billion years, our Earth formed approximately 4.5 billion years ago. They also agree that since its formation, the Earth, its geology, its environments has changed under the effect of numerous physical and chemical forces and used to do so. They also agree that life appeared on Earth at least 2.5 billion years ago. Sure, maybe older, but everyone can agree at least 2.5 billion years ago. And since its first appearance on Earth, life has taken many forms, all of which continue to evolve in ways that paleontology and the modern biological and biological uh, biochemical sciences are describing with independently uh, and independently confirming with increasing precision commonalities in the structure of the, of the genetic code of all organisms living today clearly indicate their common origins. So these are evidence-based facts, never contradicted by scientific results, that the National Academies of Sciences for all of these countries have agreed upon. Now, there are more than 67 national academies, uh, I mean, uh, countries, excuse me, but some countries don't have academies. So we have the uh, Academy of Sciences for the Developing World here and the, uh, um, the African Academy of Sciences, which has member scientists representing those countries that do not have their own, um, their, their own uh, national academies. And I find it interesting that 
all of these national academies with their top scientists have no problem agreeing to those statements as being evidence-based facts never contradicted by scientific results because it's very difficult to get a bunch of scientists to agree on anything, but they agree to this. And I also think it's interesting to look at the countries here. Of course, you have the American National, uh, the American uh, Academy of Sciences and the Canadians, um, lots of uh, Europeans uh, represented here. But we also have the Academy of Scientific Research and Technology of Egypt, the Indonesian Academy of Sciences, the Academy of Sciences of the Islamic Republic of Iran, the Turkish Academy of Sciences, the Academy of the Kingdom of Morocco, the Palestine Academy of Science and Technology, and the Pakistan Academy of Sciences, signing on an agreement to this. Now, I find that very interesting because we have this kind of global cross-cultural agreement among the scientific community to these uh, very clear statements about evolution. So let's come back to the United States then. If we have kind of scientific consensus on this, what do American professional organizations hold as the role of evolution in biology courses? Well, our largest um, professional organization for biology education is the National Association of Biology Teachers. And according to Wayne Carley, uh, its executive director, evolution is the cornerstone and the building block of modern biology. It should be the centerpiece of modern biology education. And the official statement of the National Association of Biology Teachers is very specific. It says, as stated in the American Biology Teacher, their peer-reviewed journal, by Theodosius Dobzhansky, nothing in biology makes sense except in the light of evolution. This often quoted assertion accurately illuminates the central unifying role of evolution in nature and therefore in biology. They go on to say, whether it's called creation science, scientific creationism, intelligent design theory, young earth theory, or some other synonym, creation beliefs have no place in the science classroom. Explanations employing non-naturalistic or supernatural events, whether or not explicit references made to a supernatural being, are outside the realm of science and not part of a valid science curriculum. That's what the United States professional organizations say about the teaching of evolution uh, and uh, about including um, uh, non-scientific uh, or, or supernatural or religious explanations. Uh, in curricula. And there's particular reasons for this. Okay, so if we wanted to think about teaching creationism or religious um, explanations for the diversity of life, is that actually legal to do in public high schools in the United States? And when I say public, I mean those that are supported by uh, our uh, government and, and uh, public taxes. Um, so is that legal? Could we even teach about special creationism in our schools? And the answer might surprise you. The answer is yes, but don't quote that. We have to have some qualifiers here. All right, so we have to add clear indication that we're talking about creation. You can't teach creationism as factual or science or uh, well, let's let's break this down. OK, you have to maintain in the United States the separation of church and state. So you can teach about creationism, but you have to do that in the proper context. That means you can't teach it as a science. You could teach it in a social science course or a humanities course or in a comparative religion course where you're talking about the different things that people believe across the different kinds of religions that there are, it can't be devotional, it can't be discriminatory, and it can't be intended to promote any particular religion. It can't be used to disparage evolution, and it can't be presented as a scientifically valid alternative to evolution. If you maintain all those things, you could teach about creationism in the United States but you have to adhere to these things to maintain the separation of church and state. 
All right, so let's go back to where I'm from. This is Arkansas again. That is my high school that I attended so many years ago that I actually had hair and played football, American football. Um, that was a very different kind of experience to what a lot of students have in the United States today because my biology education, my evolution education was shaped by a lot of cultural uh, rifting, uh, kind of contentious um, legal court battles over the teaching of evolution and uh, the teaching of creationism that played out in and around my home state. You might be familiar with some of these court cases. Perhaps the most famous is the 1925 Scopes Monkey Trial, where there was actually a law that made it illegal to teach evolution in the state of Tennessee and several other states, including my home state of Arkansas. They're called Butler Acts. Um, and in 1925, a teacher named John Scopes was convicted of breaking that law by teaching evolution. And that was actually what the people wanted to happen uh, who put John Scopes in this position because they wanted to challenge the legality of the law itself that made it illegal. The thing is, the judge kind of made a mistake in the fine that was levied against him. So it didn't actually go to appeal. And the laws that made it illegal to teach evolution remained on the books in Tennessee and many other states like Arkansas until 1968. That's a long time. And in my home state, people started to think about um, what's going on here because between 1925 and 1968, we had something going on uh, called the Cold War. Uh, the United States was kind of uh, embroiled in this uh, contest with uh, Russia and other countries. And in the 50s, when Russia launched Sputnik uh, into space, the space race was on and people were very worried that um, the Soviets were going to beat us uh, at science. So there was this big push to uh, improve our science education, uh, which meant include improving biology education, which meant getting the central uh, principle into all of the textbooks. So evolution kind of came into the textbooks uh, across the entire country, and people kind of forgot that it was actually illegal technically in some of these states to teach it. Until in 1968 in my home state, about the time that uh, my mother was graduating from high school, um, there was a big, huge battle in my home state over the teaching of evolution. Um, they uh, got a person, Susan Epperson, to teach a lesson on evolution. And then uh, basically because it was illegal, uh, there had to be repercussions. And this case was appealed all the way up to the United States Supreme Court that struck down the law against teaching evolution. The court held that the state, um, the, the, that, that the statute was unconstitutional on the grounds that the First Amendment to the United States Constitution does not permit a state to require that teaching and learning must be tailored to the principles or prohibitions of any particular religious sect or doctrine. So that made it illegal to make it illegal to teach evolution. So you could teach evolution everywhere in the United States. But that wasn't good enough for a lot of folks who said, well, I tell you what, if you're going to teach evolution, then you also have to teach about creationism. So in 1982, again in Arkansas, there was a big court case about the balanced treatment statue that said that uh, you had to teach uh, creationism anytime you taught uh, evolution to balance it out. But the court said that that was not um, constitutional, and it further declared that creation science is not, in fact, a science. But that was just in Arkansas. It didn't make it all the way up to the, uh, to the Supreme Court until a few years later. Now, this is when I was going into high school, and this case started in Louisiana, just south of the border of my home state. Uh, in this case, which was a huge deal, it was very contentious. 
Um, the United States Supreme Court held that Louisiana's Creationism Act was unconstitutional. Creation science impermissibly endorsed religion. Uh, and that meant that you couldn't do the balance treatment anymore uh, in the United States, but that didn't stop the court cases. In 1990, we had a case where uh, a teacher said that it violated their free speech rights to uh, uh, ask them to teach evolution, uh, but the court found that the, um, the curriculum uh, was uh, sound, solid, uh, and to be upheld and that holding a teacher to teach the state approved curriculum was not a violation of their free speech rights. In 1994, this was tested on free exercise of religion, but the courts found that requiring a teacher to teach the state approved curriculum does not violate their religious uh, freedom. Uh, again, back in um, Louisiana, um, we had a, a situation where a, a teacher was, re was reading a disclaimer um, about evolution whenever they taught about evolution, ostensibly to promote critical thinking. But uh, the courts rejected that policy. Uh, and also uh, this was notable uh, for uh, equating intelligent design uh, with creation science, uh, therefore not uh, permissible in public schools. States. Kept on going. In 2000, Rodney Levesque uh, said that uh, he wanted to teach the evidence both for and against evolution, uh, but the judge declared that he didn't have any free speech right, rights to override the curriculum, uh, and he did, and it was not a violation of his uh, religious rights either. Uh, and then we come to Kitzmiller. Uh, versus Dover in the state of Pennsylvania, pretty close to me now. Uh, this was the first challenge to teaching intelligent design in the public school science classrooms. And the federal judge there determined that intelligent design is not science, that intelligent design cannot uncouple itself from its creationist and thus religious antecedents. And that policy was found to be unconstitutional. Uh, the Dover Area School Board was ordered to refrain from maintaining the intelligent design policy in any school, from requiring teachers to denigrate or disparage the scientific theory of evolution, and from requiring teachers to refer to a religious alternative theory known as intelligent design. Same year, in the state of Georgia, there had been uh, disclaimer stickers warning students against evolution uh, in the state of uh, Georgia in Cobb County, but the court concluded there that uh, those science, uh, 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 those stickers in the science textbook violated the establishment clause of the First Amendment to the Constitution um, because that, that would be interpreted as a message of endorsement. Uh, they appealed that, um, and the um, defense brought in the, uh, excuse me, the plaintiffs brought in the uh, expert witnesses from the Dover Intelligent Design case, and they quickly settled that case without a retrial. And in that settlement, the board and district are barred from making any oral or written disclaimers about uh, evolution or Darwin from placing stickers in textbooks about creationism, creation science, intelligent design, or any, any other religious view concerning the origins of life or origins of human beings. And they are barred from excising or redacting materials on evolution in student science textbooks in perpetuity. And they had to pay a lot of money in order to do that. So in summary, there have been a lot of court cases in the United States, a lot of them. It's been a contentious cultural issue for a long time. And the anti-evolution laws and policies have failed uh, every time in the courts. Teaching creationism, whether you call it creation science or intelligent design in a public school science class, it's not just unlawful, it's unconstitutional. That means you can't make a law to make it illegal to teach evolution or to teach a creationist idea because that law itself would be unconstitutional. And that goes for any disclaimers or any demigration of evolutionary science on the basis of religion at all. So that's what's been going on in the United States legally. 
in science, in education. But there's this huge disconnect between what is taught about in schools or what's supposed to be. There's this huge disconnect between the scientific community and the public in general. We've been doing polls, surveys, and large scale standardized tests and other quantitative measures of people's understandings and belief about evolution. And they're commonly used to um, communicate how well we are doing when it comes to science education. Uh, a pretty uh, uh, big one that you might see is a comparison of the United States uh, and a bunch of uh, Western countries uh, in the European Union uh, and Japan um, on the public acceptance of evolution. I know you can't read that figure there, I'll make it bigger. All right, so this is a response to a question about acceptance of evolution of whether it is true or the respondents are not sure or whether evolution is false. And the scientists in the United States were very, very, very alarmed to find that the United States is all the way down here at the bottom of evolution acceptance, second only to Turkey. And that made huge news. And then a colleague of mine um, who is from Pakistan, Salman Hamid, said, if you think that's interesting. You should be bracing for Islamic creationism, he said in pages of the journal Science, and said, you know what, Turkey is actually probably pretty high on acceptance for Islamic uh, majority uh, countries, and published uh, this one uh, that uh, showed that um, actually Tur Turkey would fall uh, largely ahead on acceptance of evolution of other countries with Pakistan falling below that. But we had some questions about that, all right? So here's the uh, chart from uh, those countries, including the United States, the European Union, Japan, and, uh, and, and this is the question that was asked to them. Human beings, as we know them, developed from earlier species of animals. And that question was, um, kind of construed as being a good one for determining people's acceptance of evolution. So that's how the United States um, uh, kind of compared to those countries. Now, here is from Hamid uh, in the same journal, Science, looking at evolution acceptance in Muslim majority countries. So you can see where uh, Pakistan uh, falls out. But the question is very different. The question that was asked here was, do you agree or disagree with Darwin's evolution? It's not the same question at all. And there are actually problems with that question, with both of those questions, and certainly with comparing the two of them. We were really wondered about this when I was at uh, McGill and we tried to figure out, you know, what's going on in all of these um, countries with large Muslim populations. We actually got a nice grant from the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council of Canada uh, to study teaching and learning about biological evolution in the Muslim world. We did a survey uh, and other types of studies in several different countries among Muslim populations, uh, including uh, Muslim populations in the United States and Canada to some extent but also in Turkey, Lebanon, Egypt, Indonesia, and Pakistan. Uh, the data, well, we got 5,500 uh, 5, surveys from Egyptian, Indonesian, Lebanese, Turkish, Pakistani, and Canadian Muslim high school students. We interviewed about 150 Muslim scientists, science teachers, and community members. Uh, we had focus group uh, discussions with Muslim teachers. Uh, we had discussions with Canadian, Indonesian, Pakistani, Turkish, and Lebanese research collaborators. And we had discussions with Muslim scientists and evolutionary biologists. And we did a survey of biology curricula and textbooks from these countries. Uh, it was hard to do, <laughs> even just to build a survey to, uh, to ask the same questions in these countries 
that had been asked in Western contexts um, was very difficult. We constructed the survey in English and translated it into Arabic, Bahasa, French, Turkish, and Urdu. Uh, we did this through a very um, difficult process where we actually got um, translators that were certified by government institutions in these countries to translate our surveys, but we also took those translations and passed them by uh, experts in science and education. Pardon me. The survey measured participants' attitudes toward and scientific and religious understandings of evolution according to a five-point scale. Uh, to a, uh, their, their agreement to these statements. Um, and if you want to learn about how we put that together, we actually published on that, and I'm happy to share that paper. You can find it um, on my profile in research. Um, just the translation was very difficult. Some, some terms were very hard to accurately, accurately translate. Uh, evolution, very difficult because the word for evolution in Arabic, and I believe in Urdu, is the same as the word for development. So when we're asking about people's agreement with biological evolution, some people would think of that in terms of their uh, interpretation of that particular word as uh, biological development, as in uh, development from single-celled egg to a fully developed organism. And of course, they would agree with that. Um, the word ancestor was difficult uh, in different contexts, not so much in Pakistan, but it was very difficult in places like um, Indonesia to uh, make sure that we were talking about biological organisms as ancestral to others. Uh, related was a difficult term when we're talking about biological relationships. And the term supernatural was very difficult when we're talking about uh, religious explanations or those that have to do with spiritual kinds of contexts or things that are, um, you know, uh, you know, it's, it's very difficult to have the same context across, across cultures for that particular concept, because when we're looking at religious um, explanations in the West, that's kind of understood as supernatural, maybe not necessarily part of the physical world, a spiritual belief, those kinds of things. But uh, within Islam, um, the, the, the idea of natural had to do with, uh, you know, when we talk about supernatural, it meant to a lot of people more like unnatural. And what could be more natural uh, than uh, your religious understandings? Um, uh, and, and, and so it was difficult to kind of make that um, uh, uh, clear what we intended to mean. But we went through this and uh, we got a pretty good survey and we can tell you about some of our general conclusions here. Uh, first, we found that evolution is actually very well accepted among university level scientists in the Islamic countries that we study. Uh, but many of those scientists develop very deeply nuanced interpretations of scripture to reconcile evolution and Islam. Um, there were a couple of folks who I uh, am very uh, fond and familiar of, uh, good friends of mine who are part of this effort. Um, one of them is uh, Ihab Abu Heif, who is Canada Research Chair in Evolutionary Developmental Biology. Um, you may know the uh, the name Abu Heif if you've ever been to uh, Egypt, uh, Alexandria. The beach there uh, by the library at Alexandria is called the Abu Heif Beach. Uh, uh, Ihab's grandfather was the great Abu Heif, uh, the Nile crocodile, probably one of the greatest ma marathon swimmers of all time. Um, Ihab is a really great guy. He's a wonderful scientist. Um, but he is a devout Muslim, and in his lab at um, McGill University, he stops uh, his science uh, regularly for Islamic prayer, uh, and he says, my daily scientific activities of performing evolution-centered research do not conflict with my daily spiritual activities as a Muslim. 
I strongly believe one can practice evolutionary biology without compromising one's faith as a Muslim. Similarly, my good friend, Dr. Uh, Anila Askar, who is from uh, Pakistan, uh, she's a professor of science education at McGill University. And so many times I've heard her say, if Allah can create, then why cannot Allah evolute? Interesting ideas from these folks. Um, and some more of our general conclusions are that evolution is actually very well represented in the curricula and textbooks of the Islamic countries that we studied. Although religious content is actually common as well. And that might be due to political necessity, but it's also very important that there's no strict separation of church and state in some of these countries, including Pakistan. So if I look at the goals for science education uh, curricula in Pakistan, in the textbooks that we were reading, the goals that were set up in these governmentally produced textbooks include that uh, students are supposed to um, come to appreciate that Allah is creator and sustainer of the universe. That's in the front of a governmentally produced biology textbook, most of them actually. And that's something you would never see in the United States. This is uh, a copy of one of the textbooks uh, from Pakistan. Uh, and one of the things that I really enjoyed about the presentation in the, in the textbooks that um, I reviewed was that they did include a lot of scripture. They included a lot of um, uh, interpretation of scripture, um, but that was very clearly labeled Islamic concepts. And after the presentation of Islamic concepts, they moved into scientific concepts. Now, this is very very important thing to hear, recognize the importance of the and then coming to conclude that a close study of the above sermons realize, uh, reveals that all animals had common origin, but they gradually underwent changes afterwards and became different from each other. Some developed crawling, started walking on two legs, and some had four. It seemed that animals of today are advanced forms of past animals who achieve this form after passing through many changes. That is very refreshing uh, from my particular context. <clears throat> Pardon me. Um, so we also found that secondary teachers in the Islamic countries that we study uh, didn't have as much uh, knowledge about evolution as their university level counterparts, which is understandable, but they also didn't have the level of acceptance that their university level counterparts did. And their teaching attitudes, uh, their, their attitudes toward their, uh, and their practices regarding evolution, they varied greatly between the different countries. Um, in Islamic countries that had high acceptance rates, uh, uh, excuse me, secondary students had pretty high acceptance rates for some aspects of evolution, very low acceptance rates for others. Human evolution was particularly problematic. Uh, the religious beliefs are an important factor uh, influencing how they perceive uh, evolutionary theory and science in general, and faith often trumps the evidence. Uh, also, students and teachers who represented religious minorities were more likely to hold creationist ideas. So let's come back to this comparison. We already know that the questions aren't exactly the same. Um, so let's go ahead and use our survey and come back to compare actually the same question. And what we find is that Pakistan is actually on top here and Turkey is well below in terms of acceptance of evolution here. 
<clears throat> pardon me, I'm losing my voice here. Bad time to have that happen. Um, to blow that up a little bit, it says, uh, and, and to talk about a different question in general, uh, if we ask this question, human beings as we know them develop from earlier species of animals? Uh, this is about what we would expect, but if we change that to, to take humans out of the equation <clears throat> and just say that fossils show that life has existed for billions of years and changed over time, very high acceptance. Pakistani students, well over 80% acceptance for this particular thing. And if we could see this result in the United States, science educators would be thrilled and would be talking about how much better of a job we are doing with science education. We also found that there isn't just one Islamic way of thinking about evolution. Many Muslims have embraced evolution as a well-evidenced and fundamental principle of modern science. But others have rejected it completely uh, if their interpretation of scripture and religious beliefs conflict with evolutionary theory. But between these two mindsets, there's a whole continuum of positions held by Muslims uh, who have reconciled evolutionary theory with religious perspectives on creation. And there's just as much diversity of thought around evolution among Muslims as there is among Christians. You may have known that, but that was surprising to many people uh, in North America. All right, so thinking about that diversity, and thinking about the difference between our two different contexts, uh, I hope that we can have a pretty good conversation about um, your context and uh, how uh, you are presenting uh, evolution uh, or how we can think about this critically in order to do better uh, in science education in general. I think at this time we were gonna have some questions. If you wouldn't mind, could I take just a minute? <laughs> uh, anything about questions? Yes, I'll sure. be, okay, I'll be right back. All right, I'm back. Uh, hopefully we can have some good conversation and discussion. Okay, sir, thank you so much for giving us this enlightening and this entertaining presentation of the issue of evolution. I think discussed. Uh, sir, I would uh, now request my participants to ask questions. Uh, the forum is open. Uh, you can have our participants, they have two options. They can either raise their hands or they can write their question in the chat box. So I can see that uh, someone is raising his hand. Let me see. Okay. Uh, Mary, sir, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Yeah. Sir, Amir Raja, can you please unmute yourself and ask the question? Thank you, Ms. Nosheen Rana. Thank you very much. And I'm very pleased to see uh, Mr. Jason Wiles. I hope that I'm pronouncing his name well. And uh, yeah, thank you. I, I can see your smile. That means that I have pronounced your name well. Absolutely. Okay. Thank you. Uh, thank, thank you very much indeed. 
first of all, I'll have to, you know, once again, you know, welcome you. And on the behalf of PASS, being member of the PASS organization, I think it is yet another good uh, webinar and good uh, interactive session, which have been organized by our, by our organization PASS. And I think this is, this is one of the key areas uh, in overall idea of critical thinking that has been, as you know, uh long long i would say uh, haunting us and it's been a kind of you know question that has not only been you know a question of uh, great importance for many students of schools secondary schools and even early you know uh, level learning schools and even universities colleges where these questions are mostly you know concerned and I, I could actually, you know, I could relate myself as well. When I was student of secondary school and I opted biology as my secondary school subject. So being student of biology, I could still imagine that our teachers had always, you know, uh, what I could say, had always, you know, dis, dis, discouraged us or actually, you know, I mean, uh, very systematically or uh, uh, in a very you know prudent manner what i say i mean in a very in a very you know uh, uh, shrewd manner may i say shrewd manner they actually you know applied certain ways through which we 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 actually you know i mean hesitated or actually, you know avoided any possible question that could have actually you know led to opening up such debate at school level and i think when you carry such you know ambiguities in your mind you actually you know, carry such ambiguities for your rest of life and later on we realized later on actually you know i realized that these are the areas which are basically out of bound areas we cannot actually you know, treat on such areas and we we, we 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 must you know understand what are our limits in the in the socio uh, i mean public sphere social public sphere or you know social educational or academic public sphere so that is my experience. Now, coming to your presentation, you have actually you know, uh, presented your case by comparing USA's case and Pakistan's case. I, though I have very little understanding and little reading about USA's case, I was just you know, reading some stuff which is available on Google right now because you see, I wasn't prepared for it. So there was some reference to United American American, you know, I mean, uh, sort of uh, uh, organization which deals regarding it, American affiliation, scientific affiliation or something like that was mentioned there. So, uh, I mean, they term it a clever design of God through which, you know, uh, creation has actually you know, taken place and it is, actually, you know, evolving. So, I mean, they have somehow, somehow reached to certain, you know, conclusion and reached to certain, you know, understanding which which can actually you know open up new avenues of discussion and this is how actually you know they have addressed it but what is our problem now we have very serious kind of you know problem that whenever our teachers you know go to the classroom they say look children understand this is what science describes about you know evolution theory and darwin has said so but remember we are muslims and we cannot, you know, question our faith, belief. I mean, they actually draw a binary that science, is, science the, the, the discourse of science or the narrative of science is basically primarily it is in contradiction or in conflict with the, with the one which, which we, you know, uh, read and subscribe in our faith or in our, in our belief. So, I mean, I think there is, and you have mentioned in your, you know, uh, talk, that uh, certain you have mentioned about you know legal battles and there have been certain you know legal you know I mean uh, verdicts and decrees have been issued by your certain courts and you have mentioned one of the uh, states as well. So that is not the case here in Pakistan. Rest assured. And and you have also mentioned a couple of books reference that the sustainer and the creator of whole universe is only you know Allah Almighty and we actually believe in it without any doubt. And that is basically basically part of our larger belief and that is a part of our political belief as well because state has been you know propounding it consistently but there is a question that how we can actually you know move on with the idea of you know learning in a critical manner when actually you know 
there has been general universal consensus on the part of all those you know people who have been either you know uh, doing some stuff in the scientific research or who have been teaching science i mean why can't we actually you know reach to certain certain consensus by actually you know sitting together though we have scientific foundation here scientific academy you have mentioned but actually you know the debate hasn't been actually you know, there and the debate is not being allowed to actually you know open up and actually you know uh, this is our problem and i tell you my question here uh, is that how would you actually you know take up this matter when certain certain level even in the universities cannot talk about actually you know this particular you know yeah, issue of evolution oh, okay i just want to make sure you were okay because i no. know sometimes you're not feeling good so okay so, I'm, I'm, I'm so, sorry, I, so, I lost the train here. <laughs> yeah, yeah, final, final, final. My, my question is that how, how would you, how would you actually, you know, address this question by actually, you know, by, 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 by uh, realizing state of discourse in academic learning that this idea of scientific evolution is not being entertained even by teachers right. or even by the larger intelligentsia of the academia. I mean, how we can actually you know, engage into this situation to actually you know, reach to certain you know, debate first, and then we might reach to certain you know, consensus. So this is my question to you. I hope that my question is clear. Okay, I, I think I understand. Uh, you know, it's, it's kind of uh, one of these things where It's a different context, right? So I think it's actually Pakistan is better positioned to have these conversations in uh, your classrooms with teachers and students in conversation because uh, you don't have the separation of church and state which must be maintained in the United States public schools. So you, you have kind of the, um, the framework for a good discussion of science and religion. Uh, and it's actually there in your texts. And, and one of the things that we have uh, had very good um, uh, success with in the United States in terms of helping people to understand um, re religion and, and become more comfortable with science vis-a-vis uh, -vis uh, uh, religion is to talk about the nature of science itself. How does science work? Um, and that is something that you can do anywhere, right? You can talk about what does science do and what does science not do um, in terms of testing, in terms of uh, measuring the natural world uh, and putting those boundaries where science cannot answer questions uh, outside of what you can uh, test uh, and measure against the natural world that you can observe. Uh, so we have found that as students start to understand how science works and what science can't do, they start to see it as less of a potential threat to their religious understandings because they come to understand that science doesn't ask those questions, it doesn't approach those kinds of things, and that uh, in your um, kind of understanding of religious concepts, science isn't a threat but perhaps can be a tool. Uh, for students to say, hey, how can we uh, think about scripture? How can we interpret scripture? How do we think about our religious understandings? Uh, and uh, students who know how science works and what it can be used for, then can say, well, I have a question. Is that a religious question or is that a scientific question? If it is something where I'm wondering about something in scripture, and science tells me that this is true in nature, then perhaps my uh, interpretation of scripture might include uh, what I know to be true uh, from science uh, as well. Um, and I think that uh, you also have in your science textbooks um, a very clear um, kind of missive, a, a, an exhortation of students to study biology so that they will understand Allah's creation. Um, so uh, that they are free then 
to think about how do we learn about things scientifically and how that might under, uh, you know, inform our understanding of our place uh, in the world vis-a-vis uh, -vis our religious understandings as well without it necessarily being a threat. And I think your textbooks, uh, the ones that I have seen and reviewed anyway, do a very good job of separating out, these are scientific concepts, this is what we've learned from science and Islamic concepts. Um, and, and teaching. Uh, so I think really getting students to understand and teachers to understand how science works, what the boundaries of science are, and that it might not be the threat that they could otherwise perceive to the religious understandings is a good starting point. Um, and, and I think getting teachers the training on that uh, is, is a very good thing to do uh, moving into the schools itself. That's one of the things that we don't do very well here either in terms of teaching uh, teachers about how to teach these difficult concepts. So it, it doesn't surprise me at all to hear you say that that might be avoided <laughs> or, or thought about as something we can't really talk about. It's uncomfortable. So there again, if we can get teachers the training on how science works and how to talk about it with students, then we're gonna go a long way to getting toward those discussions that you're looking for. Thank you so much for that question. Okay, I think uh, Mr. Rami Raja is quite satisfied with the answer. Yes, I can see the smile. Thank you, sir. Okay, uh, so, uh, Mr. Bulan Iqbal, he wants to ask one question. Mr. Bulan, can you please unmute yourself and ask your yeah. question? Can, can you listen to me? Hello? Yes, I can. Thank I you. can hear yeah. you fine. Great. Thank you, Dr. Wills. I, I actually uh, really appreciate your topic and your whole demonstration and dis and a very thorough description about this issue. I would uh, rather ask to you something which is uh, a little different because I'm just going towards the reconciliation of uh, the both the ideology, the evolution and the faith. And for some time, like say, for example, I believe like, okay, let's go with that, that God creates this open universe through natural process rather than magic God. That's, that's not bad. We can go into that way. And then we can come to the point like, okay, all this physiology, ecology, biochemistry, and all these systemic things is going to be affected with this theory. Okay, that's again good. I'm going to take this way. Then the next step comes. Okay, how does it going to affect? Then we're going to go into the other branches. We can see like the astrophysicians is going to sp speak about the evolution of the solar system of the universe. That's great. Geologist is going to discuss about the evolution of the earth interior. That would be great psychologist of the evolution is going to, uh, 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 psychologist is going to speak about the evolution of the mind, and then topologist about the evolution of the culture, and the historian, you know, all by one by one, we can see like all the fashions of the of the life is going to be discussed in the in the whole pathway of evolution, that would be great. I am very happy. Now the problem is start, why take 1.1 150 uh, years to establish this theory like a gravity, I feel like the problem is start from the social Darwinism. And my question about that part, how do you take, I know this is not a direct question for a biologist like you, but the problem is start when you're going to start all this theory into the school part. Now the students going to be convinced for the racism, for the colonialism, for the social stratification, which is going to be uh, justified by this theory and which is what which is what's happening now the next problem is the countries like pakistan or all those underdeveloped countries you can see you know politically we are behind 100 years and we have all these issues very in a prim stage to develop so that theory going to that direction cause more trouble you know that's my problem. So how do you take from your part? I would rather just come to this point. What, what do you think? Is it that the reason we are not establishing this theory or something else we are missing? I'm missing here. Okay, I, I'm, I'm going to try to come around to what I'm understanding as your question. Uh, yeah. And, and I, I didn't know where you were going at first, but now I, I understand, right? So, so the concern is um, not about whether evolution is real or true or whether we yeah, should discuss it or whether we can talk about it in a way that is constructive but the threat 
of um, perceived negative um, uh, Im uh, implications. Um, mm -hmm. so, so if this is true, uh, then perhaps maybe social Darwinism, those kinds of things, right? Uh, mm -hmm. Racism, those kinds of things that you mentioned. Um, so I think it is true about anything in science that it can potentially be used for um, uh, inappropriate and maybe even evil. <laughs> uh, um, yeah. you know, so, so when you think about something like um, atomic energy, for example, uh, the scientists who were studying the composition of the atom, uh, nuclear fission and fusion, um, I think it's uh, easy to say that many of them, if not most or all, were mostly interested in understanding the problem, understanding the universe, how it works, what's going on here. Um, a, a, a good uh, scientific, um, you know, defensible, uh, non-evil kind of approach to understanding the, uh, the universe. Now, have some people come along and thought of other ways to use the knowledge that uh, was discovered? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, I don't know of anyone who would support the idea of nuclear warfare as something we should definitely do. I don't think anybody wants that. Mm -hmm. But does that mean that scientists should never have studied the composition of the atom or that students shouldn't learn about the composition of the atom, right? So when it comes to things like evolution, which is fundamental to under how things work in nature, if we have uh, uh, ecological issues with non-native species, or if we have um, response to changing um, agricultural practices or uh, changing environmental uh, situ situations according to uh, climate change, our understanding of how evolution works is very informative to these very important real world problems. When we see something like the coronavirus and um, uh, evolution of new um, variants that might evade our vaccinations. Understanding of evolution is very important to uh, explaining what we might uh, expect and, and acting accordingly. So I think it's very important that the scientists of today and tomorrow learn about these things that kind of govern the problems that they're trying to solve for all of us for the good of humanity. Uh, understanding that some may bend those things that are true toward purposes that are not good. And that is the case with everything. So I don't think I want to be in a world where we can't learn about things because some people might uh, use them for ill, but more focus on uh, how we can learn better about the natural world while also teaching people um, about, uh, you know, morals, ethics, and the ways that science can be governed uh, to avoid uh, the, um, the things that people may do otherwise. Um, and so when, when you look at something like social Darwinism or racism, uh, those things are rooted more so in hate than they are in some perception of uh, you know, science as something that drives hate. I think if you have that hate, if you have that um, bend toward um, othering people, then you can use whatever that you want to justify that, whether it's science or anything else. So I think that is a, a good conversation to have with students about uh, whether truth uh, is worth finding, whether uh, exploration in science is worth doing, uh, even though some may choose to use what they find for evil. And thinking about how we can develop people who have a, a system of values 
uh, and to teach students about um, ethics and uh, science governance and those kinds of things that prevent those, uh, those people from using uh, information for uh, ill purposes. Those are all things that we should do as well. They're not all necessarily science, right? So uh, science is governed by ethics, but ethics isn't necessarily itself science. So we definitely need to have these conversations, avoid something that is um, valuable and useful in and of itself, because some might choose uh, to apply it in ways that are not appropriate or that are harmful. I hope okay. I've answered the yeah, question. I think Mr. Balanikwal uh, has got his answer. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I really appreciate your, you know, thanks a lot. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, Mr. Jason, we have next question from a student, Jueri Afta, and she is uh, kind of complaining about one thing, that in Pakistan, we uh, only science students, they know about evolution and scientific revolution. How can other students, like how can other students from other fields, how can they know about this evolution system and the law of evolution? Uh, what do you suggest to them? Okay, so let me let me see if I understand the question. Um, if you're studying biology, yeah. we, we can do a pretty good job with this, but how do we uh, teach this for people who might not be studying biology? <laughs> okay, uh, I, I think I get that. So in the United States, that's another thing that's very different. Um, I, I, we have kind of this kind of baseline curriculum that includes uh, the sciences that includes history, that includes uh, uh, you know, mathematics and different areas of study. And kind of everybody has to do this all the way through the end of high school. And even if you go to university, they kind of come back to a core curriculum that includes all those things, as well as your specific discipline that you might specialize in. And I know that that's a very different system than you might find in other countries. Uh, and it sounds like Pakistan too, you kind of specialize perhaps relatively early compared to our context. So uh, when I was in Canada, that was also uh, an issue too, because uh, we would find that um, people didn't really understand evolution and they, or there were some problems that were going on there. And when we looked into the curriculum, we found that they only taught about evolution in the very highest level biology courses for students who are going to university to study biology that was a very different context. So how do we make this um, something that more people can learn about? First, I think um, it's good to start early. Uh, so elementary schools are good places for people to learn about things like um, adaptation and how organisms can change within their environment as the environment changes. Um, that is something that you can have in the early grades. Um, we can talk about things like um, the connections between uh, living things in their ecosystems, in their habitats, how they rely on each other, and how they have come to rely on each other through a history that they share. Um, the other part of that, I think, is that all students, uh, regardless of their discipline, what, whatever it is that they're, they're studying, uh, perhaps it would be a very good idea to talk about science in general and how science works, the nature of science itself, so that when they are, you know, perhaps they're, 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 they are business people, or perhaps they are, um, you know, in, the, in the, the restaurant industry, or whatever people might do, whatever people might study, if they have some understanding of how science works, when they read an article, or when they see a science um, documentary, or, or, or when they uh, learn some information about uh, science itself, whatever they studied, if they know about how science works, then they can kind of critically evaluate the kind of information that comes in. So I don't think you have to be a biologist to understand how science works as biology is being presented in an article or you know a documentary or something that the biologists who do that work according to the science 
principles, you know, how science works that everyone tends to know. So when you look at even the academies of sciences that I presented early on, they were talking about evidence coming from physics, from uh, biology, from chemistry, from geology, and a physicist and isn't a biologist, but they can understand that their biologists and physicist uh, colleagues practice science in the same way that and that the results have been reviewed within that community according to those standards and under the and under the the same kinds of guidelines and ethics and practices so that you can kind of accept science from the scientists that practice science science in the way that you do whether or not you are in that particular field yourself and i think that probably extends to people who are you know uh, in whatever field that there may be, if in the early grades in education, we talk about science itself, how it works, how scientists do the work that they do, then they don't necessarily need to be experts in every scientific field in order to understand that what the people who work in those fields do is rooted in that science that we know how it works. So that's one of my, my, my big fundamental things is I, I, I hope that we teach about how science works better, whether or not we teach all of the tiny little details of every okay. scientific field. Thank you, Dr. Jason. It is a well explained answer. Uh, next, we have a kind of comment by Marwa Khalid, and she is saying that thinking with understanding of science, then students may get more understanding of this process of evolution. And secondly, she is saying that there is not much difference between the basic concepts of evolution in Islam, what uh, Allah is talking about, and what science is saying. So my, uh, I want to ask one question related to this point. And why is there a difference of opinion about evolution between religion and science. Why is this clash existing? Why don't they agree upon Okay, well, thing? so for, first of all, I have to say that the, many people do not find that clash. Yeah. Um, and what I find very most interesting is that it tends to be the people who have studied science the most and people who have studied religion the most who are the best at understanding that there doesn't necessarily need to be a conflict. Um, so when people don't know as much about science and when people don't know as much about a, a religion, then it makes it much more easy to have very simplified understandings of both and uh, to expect that one or the other needs to be in conflict with the other. Um, I wanna come back to uh, something that um, Amir Raja has said, uh, um, that uh, he was talking about the scientific affiliation uh, that he found on Google. That's actually a very good group of scientists who are very religious, who are very open in discussing their understandings and the reconciliation of their science and religion. Um, Another good group uh, is the uh, Clergy Letter Project in the United States, where um, religious leaders from, from um, uh, Judaism and even from Islam, uh, the, the Imam letter is building. Uh, it's not as big as the other ones. Um, but they uh, are religious leaders who have signed on to very clearly worded statements about their uh, acceptance of evolution, its importance, its centrality, but also confirming their religious faith in the truth of the scriptures uh, and the foundations of their belief and how these are very different things, but they can also be complementary. Um, one of our good leaders uh, here in the United States, heard of uh, Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, um, a great uh, 
leader uh, in, um, in, in civil rights, but also uh, was a minister himself, a uh, religious leader. And one of my favorite sermons of all time, it's kind of interesting to hear a biologist talking about their favorite sermons, but I do have uh, a list of favorite sermons. And one of my favorites is called A Tough Mind and a Tender Heart by Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, in which he talks about how science is very different from religion in terms of its methods um, and in terms of what they do, where science is about facts and it's about learning about the, uh, the, the material world in a way that you have to be tough minded. But religion has to do with understanding truth of a different nature and about transforming hearts uh, and uh, about having a tender heart and compassion. And that without the, you know, with only one of them, you end up with a kind of tough minded um, uh, uh, way of living that isn't informed by the compassion that you might have uh, from your religious understandings. Uh, and this particular sermon is very good at both parsing them out, but also saying that uh, we need the things that come from both of these realms. Uh, so I, I, th I think when you're, when you're looking at the idea of people looking for science and religion to be in conflict, each, uh, so that's where we need to work, I think. Um, because so many people who are scientists have come to understand that perhaps that doesn't necessarily need to be in conflict. And people who have studied religion and have, have figured out ways to reconcile their understandings as well. Um, so, so what do we do with the people who haven't studied either or both of those things enough to see uh, the, the, uh, the ways that we can be complementary or at least coexist? Um, so, so that's where we need to have that conversation. And that's why I think in, in Pakistan, you are so well positioned to do this um, because you are able to address religious understandings, Islamic concepts within the context of your scientific courses and it's laid there in your curriculum. So in a lot of ways, I might ask, um, how, we, how may we be more like uh, Pakistan? in terms of uh, having good conversations or at least having the ability to have, have these necessary conversations. Uh, and the people in my field have come to the uh, understanding that it is important to address uh, students' cultures and ending of the scientific concepts that they might perceive to be in conflict. Uh, so, you know, I, I, I'm so glad that you have the ability to do this within your framework, but your, your question is a good one. How do we get to that uh, point of, you know, being able to do that effectively when so many people are in the middle and haven't yet had that conversation? So, so I think it's a, it's a good thing to talk about how science works the nature of science itself, to frame science in the way that it is not a um, threat to uh, religious understandings, because it can't be, it's outside of the bounds of science to do so, and then have those conversations about what do we learn from science practice in this way, and how can we reconcile our religious understandings uh, with that information. Um, I, I think it's, it's also a part of the media where it, it doesn't sell more newspapers and it doesn't get more clicks and it doesn't get more advertising uh, uh, if you're telling everybody that we can all get along. We have to sow that conflict in order to make people interested. So I think getting people more interested in how we can come together instead of how we can strengthen our own particular identity against the other, if we can move toward that as a society, then we're going to see less of the conflict oh, that you're talking about. Good. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Jason, for explaining it so well. Uh, the topic is very interesting. It is very entertaining. But unfortunately, we have no uh, 
we are looking forward to have another session with you uh, uh, and now i would request mr amir raja the president of pass uh, to give actually this webinar is being conducted by pass pass is professors association uh, for student services so he is the president of pass so he would give you word thanks thank you so much thank you so much yes. machine yes mr Thank you. Uh, okay. Thank you very much indeed. Once again, Ms. Noshin, it was really very informative and perhaps it was a kind of, you know, uh, session that has actually, you know, uh, brushed or what I, what I call it, a kind of, you know, I mean, I mean, intervention that has actually, you know, I mean, ideas and stagnant imaginations, which were stagnant and which were, you know, I mean, stuck somewhere, perhaps some decades ago. And I'm very grateful to Mr. Jason Wiles, who is so grateful, who is so gracious and who is so, you know, I mean, uh, I mean, what I call that who has been so, you know, uh, lovely and who has been so, you know, I mean, uh, clear regarding his, you know, speech and who has been, you know, who has, who has, you know, explained in such a, you know, excellent manner that we, everybody who has actually you know, attended this session, they have enjoyed it a lot. And one more thing uh, before we actually you know, conclude this session, once again, I have to, you know, I mean, appreciate appreciate Ms. Nosheen Rana's uh, efforts, who has, you know, I mean, moderated this session very nicely and who has actually, you know, I mean, uh, I mean uh, moderated this session in a manner that everybody has enjoyed your talk and everybody has actually, you know, learned a lot. And uh, I would say regarding this session that Mr. Jason Wiles, uh, uh, we are, we, we, we live in a society, we live in a world now where there are certain issues and Mr. Bulan Iqbal has referred to that issue. Now we are facing new and new, you know, terms are being coined under, you know, new notions. There has been no I mean, even within, you know, Indian subcontinent, there has been xenophobia, Chinese xenophobia. So the world is unfortunately, you know, heading towards a greater divide. And I think it actually, you know, it actually, you know, borrows, uh, borrows an ideal that if we actually, you know, try to, you know, subscribe to this notion of scientific learning, scientific, you know, method of understanding things. I mean, there are, there, there are actually, you know, there is a basically, you know, a very good uh, statement from your side that we need to, you know, teach students and we need to initially, you know, train our teachers that there is clear dividing line between two different approaches, two different one particular you know, avenue which is and the, the, the method of you know, understanding things is entirely different from the scientific method. The scientific method, as you know, I mean, invites us to look into things from their you know, specific material existence. So when, when we are actually, you know, I mean, uh, teaching our students and training our teachers that the mandate of science is this that science actually you know, always talks about observing things and then you know mating things and then reaching to certain thing i mean this is how scientific skills can be you know i mean uh, imparted and in 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 as you know i mean uh, infused in the minds of those people i think this is how we can move forward that we have to you know begin first from you know uh, scientific discourse of learning that how we can actually you know inculcate this idea of scientific learning discourse in our society or anywhere in the world because you know the whole world is basically you know facing somehow some kind of you know crisis of you know uh, learning on the basis of scientific uh, skills 
So this is very nice of you that you have actually, you know, I mean, made us to think over it and actually, you know, deliberate over it. And I think it was really lovely once again that you have, you have actually, you know, in a very, you know, I mean, uh, candid manner. I think the issue, issue is not that easy, which you have actually, you know, discussed today. I think you, you might be realizing on your own because, you know, American, though, there are certain, you know, I mean, progressive minded, you know, intellectuals and progressive minded, you know, religious people who have reached a certain, you know, consensus and who have been actually, you know, propagating and promoting this, you know, scientific uh, learning method. But still, American society has its own, you know, dynamics of, you know, I mean, the subscribing to, uh, I mean, conservative, uh, pro I mean, dogmatic approaches to, you know, look at things. So we have our own, you know, crisis here. But I think the way you have candidly handled this situation and you have actually, you know, highlighted it and you have actually, you know, made us to actually, you know, uh, move with some kind of, you know, I mean, uh, uh, practical steps through which we can actually, you know, begin this, uh, this debate, which can, which can actually, you know, send, which can be centered on an idea of scientific discourse of knowledge and scientific discourse of learning and teaching. And uh, I think this is this is a kind of, you know, I mean, concluding statement from your side that I would say uh, by saying, you know, once again, it was very nice of you that you have spared your precious time and you have shared your ideas. You have actually, you know, made us to actually, you know, deliberate on this uh, topic through which we can actually, you know, promote the very, you know, I mean, uh, uh, the big theme of our organization that we have been striving hard to you know promote and inculcate in the minds of teachers and students the idea of critical thinking i think that is the theme upon which we are trying to build our you know i mean a case that how we can actually you know, make our education system more vibrant and how we can actually you know, promote the idea of scientific create scientific skills in our learning teaching and i think by saying it i hope that uh, you have also you know enjoyed our uh, session as well and i can see your smile because you see you have actually you know, i mean you have really talked in a very you know can once again and with a hope that we can actually you know uh, uh, have your views and we can have your, you know, I mean, such learn, learned, you know, sessions again and again. Thank you once again from uh, our organization past and there is another thing as some assistance and who have been, you know, partner organization that is the society, which is also promoting the idea of scientific learning in our, you know, overall education, education system. So thank you once again. And I once again, you know, say thank, thanks to you on the behalf of PASS and a lovely uh, session. And I would once again, you know, appreciate and thank who have, you know, spared their precious time and who have attended this session. And we hope that you would once again, you know, I mean, grace yourself in such sessions and make it a good you know, kind of, you know, I mean, uh, you know, tradition in actually, you know, uh, overall learning and teaching uh, exercise. Thank you once again, I hope that everybody has enjoyed it. Thanks a lot. Thank you so much. It's been my pleasure for sure. Okay, thank you, Dr. Thank you. Okay, before we say goodbye to our lovely guests, let me make a little announcement. Uh, this webinar is being recorded. The recorded version will be uploaded on YouTube. So if somebody has missed any part of this beautiful talk, uh, he or she can go and watch that uh, recorded version on YouTube. Uh, uh, thank you so much, Dr. Jason, for joining us, for giving us this beautiful talk. Uh, thank you so much and goodbye. And I say goodbye. Thank you so much. Right. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye.